So as we all know, inshallah, the topic of our learning circle is breaking the stigma of uh, men's mental health or Muslim men's mental health. Um, I guess just to kind of ground us, this month is men's, June is Men's Health Month. Um, and why we find this learning circle to be so important and pivotal to our community is really understanding the statistics of, right, one in 10 men um, who experience depression or anxiety, um, less than half of them will receive treatment. More than four times as many men as women die um, by suicide every year. More than 3 million men in the U.S. have panic disorder, agoraphobia, or really any other phobia. Um, and men have a higher death rate from the most leading cause of death, also including suicide. Um, so it's really important that we continue to talk about these, um, this important topic to provide resources and to provide a space where we're able to ask questions, inshallah. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Sheikh Suhail, inshallah, to talk to us about the particular difficulties um, of seeking mental health care or the difficulties which exacerbate mental health care, particularly to Muslim men. Um, and his own experience in, in his line of work, inshallah. Right. Zakna khairan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Inshallah, nice to be with you all um, on this, I guess, afternoon for me, maybe evening for others. And um, and I appreciate being invited to this important discussion on men's mental health. And so I think I'll talk a little bit about um, uh, men's mental health in the realm of, of the university setting and then men's mental health um, in the realm of marriage. And because there, you know, there's definitely some overlap, but there's some particularities be, be, between how a Muslim men uh, navigate or don't navigate uh, mental health support in, in these different um, spheres of life. So. You know, one of the big, and, and I'll talk about challenges, right? And the and barriers, difficulties, reasons why um, men maybe don't step forward. And one of the things that um, you know I've seen over the years working uh, at on the university level uh, with young Muslim men is that um, there is just there is a lot of uh, difficulty in term for young Muslim men to find mentorship on university campuses uh, to find, you know, perhaps older Muslim men or big brothers, so to speak, um, those that can work with them at this important transitional phase of life. Going into university for, you know, oftentimes we forget it's a huge transition for a lot of young men. Um, some of them are leaving home for the first time. Um, some of them are living alone for the first time. Some of them are just navigating basic life functions for the first time, let alone the academic rigor that um, comes with going to, um, you know, uh, universities that, that have their own uh, demands and so forth. And so, and then not having the support that they may have had in their communities, um, maybe their local imam, their local youth group leader, um, their uncles, whoever it may be that supported them, there many young men are stripped from that. And so, um, you know, finding that voice of guidance in a time when they need it most is lacking with a lot of young men. And so that becomes that there's a gap, right? And I mean, I'll tell you this, and I'll, this is just straight up real talk. Um, I'm a social worker. Um, and graduated, you know, 25 years ago, um, in, in, with my master's, that was 25 years ago, back 25 years ago, um, in this field in particular, um, you know, men who were in the field of social work, um, were, there are some question marks around their manliness, so to speak. And I'm going to be, again, real talk. Um, now fast forward 25 years, um, social work by and large is dominated by queer men. Um, and that, that is a challenge for if there's young Muslim men that want to go into, into this field in particular, and, and, you know, perhaps other fields as well, uh, other fields in the humanities where that's especially challenging for Muslim men who want to maintain a level of, um, 
what's integrity as it relates to their their understanding of their dean and wanting to live that. And so, you know, that that's a challenge. So um, uh, university can be a tough place in terms of finding that role model. The other thing that, um, you know, I've experienced or heard from many young Muslim men in the university setting is the fact that um, it is difficult for them to find within the resources that they have, even if they want to access mental health support, which those young men that are brave enough to take that step, there's a lot of challenges there. You go to university counseling services and um, you have, um, uh, you know, it's hard to find somebody that looks like you. It's hard, it's hard to find somebody that understands you. Uh, there is almost no one in the field in academic settings. And by the way, so for example, I was at U, I've been at UCLA for a number of years, and their uh, they, what they call CAPS, Counseling and Psychological Services department is massive. They have about seventy therapists on staff, seventy therapists, but there's not one that can speak to the Muslim experience authentically. Not one, let alone a Muslim, a Muslim man, um, which is more rare, a Muslim male that works in, in the field, right? So finding people that can really, that they can align with and, and get that uh, support that they need um, without having to do, I created this term, you know, Muslims in the field of who, who seek mental health treatment do, have to do a lot of backsplaining. Uh, they have to explain who they are to the person that they're seeking help and guidance and support from so that that person can understand their world. And without that backsplain, they, they don't, they don't get us. Right. And so, so that's, that's a huge um, uh, challenge for many. Um, and then just the, just the general pressures of trying to conform, you know, in, in, a, in the university world, uh, the university experience, which oftentimes can be so antithetical to the moral being of what a young Muslim man who, you know, grew up in a, in, let's say, in a masjid community, um, uh, and, and that's all they knew. And now they find it, themselves in this world where they're navigating um, alcohol, drugs, substances, being pushed into um, relationships, um, you know, uh, that don't conform uh, or don't uh, align with who with their Muslim identity and so forth, right? So, um, and then and then oftentimes the the other barriers, standard barriers, of just having a lack of support at, of home, um, where if especially in immigrant families, as sons of immigrant parents, fathers who maybe just struggled it out, they worked hard to set up life in this country. Um, they never saw their father being able to express weakness. They never learned that level of emotional, um, uh, you know, openness um, in their family setting, and, and then they carry that with them, right? So there's all of these, all of these things in the in the universities. Then you look at then you look at men in in the realm of marriage. If you you know to take on that last point I just made about. Um, Muslim men are often not taught emotional intelligence or don't have live models in front of them. Um, there's dynamics in Muslim households where um, there is very poor communication between uh, mom and dad, between, um, you know, it's a very uh, uh, oftentimes a parental dynamic that they don't young Muslim men don't take um, what they should from home. That's not always the case by any means, but in, in many households, um, that's the case. And, and so um, now you're married. Now you're supposed to be supportive of your wife. You're supposed to know how to navigate the emotional ups and downs of marriage. You're supposed to do all of these things, but you've never you've never seen that in action. Um, if that's the case, right? Again, it's not always the case, but if that's the case, well, then what do you do? How do you do? Wh where do you go? Who do you turn to, right? And and then just the raw, just the just the simple uh, fact that it's tough on the ego, 
and men typically have a bigger ego than women. <laughs> and, you know, why do I need to go to someone else to tell me how to treat my wife? Why am I going to open up about, um, I had a young, uh, I had a man that was with me the other day and opening up, up about some matters um, in his in his home and in how he's treated his wife. And it's a person in leadership and broke down crying because, you know, I, I don't, I, it, it was so hard for me, this is him, him sharing, it was so hard for me to get to this point um, to open up myself, to allow myself to be vulnerable, to um, admit to myself that I needed the help and the support, right? And, and so um, it's just, it's, you know, it's just, it's a general challenge amongst men. Um, and, and I think even there's more particular um, uh, difficulties in Muslim men stepping forward. We also have in the Muslim community this important to acknowledge there's a lot of gem- generational trauma, especially in immigrant communities and in native communities um, where, um, again, how the, 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 the image that young men today now who are, in, who are now married and who, how, who are now supposed to have it figured out they never, not only did they not see a, 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 a full portrait at home um, of what an emotionally grounded and, um, you know, connected husband and father looked like, but oftentimes they saw the opposite because of the fact that um, perhaps their father came from, from a place where there was uh, where there was war, where there was poverty, there was, um, uh, you know, serious societal uh, dysfunction that, of course, then feeds into the individual homes that are that are part of that society. And, and so, and we're just really, in many times, one generation removed from that. And we've seen that in, you know, I don't want to name particular communities, ethnic communities or anything of that sort, but but that is the case in in many uh, uh, Muslim communities. Um, And then, you know, of course that leads to the fact that there was was a lack of role modeling oftentimes in our homes where, um, you know, just men being open with with their feelings and just being able to express themselves um, in a way that is, Actually, that Islam uh, advocates for, and we'll, maybe we'll talk about later on about how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam navigated emotions and such. Um, the, we don't see that in our homes, and therefore now we we find ourselves in a marital situation where uh, there's challenges that we never expected. We never realized that marriage is about unifying uh, a vision for for a family. Um, marriage by itself, in and of itself, naturally it is, uh, ideally it's supposed to be something that uh, unites, but the reality is that in its essence, it's conflictual. It's two different people who come from two different backgrounds, who have their own worldviews and perspectives, and this is how I think the world should work. Now I have to merge with this other person, and I have to give and take, and I have to learn how to um, you know, capacity, of what this person is bringing to the table, and and if we haven't seen, um, you know, a an iteration of that, um, in our own lifetimes, it's hard to do. It's hard to just instinctively know how how to do that, and um, you know, just um, and, and I've seen we do. I do a lot of work in in the realm of marriage. We do these Muslim, what we call the Muslim marriage rejuvenation retreat. And we've been doing this for the last three three years now. My wife and I, um, uh, you know, these are opportunities for couples to to explore and to learn about best practices in marriage. is is pretty much what it is. And um, and you know, I see up up close and and personal the the difficulties that um, uh, uh, men have in terms of just. Uh, navigating um, 
many aspects of marriage, accepting influence, you know, allowing my wife to um, help guide me as opposed to just me feeling that I'm the man. This concept of arrijalu qawamuna ala nisa, you know, this is a Quranic concept that men are the maintainers, the protectors. They have a certain uh, responsibility that they hold in marriage. But that's not a that's not a trump card. That's not a you know I am in charge of everything. I am the sole um, voice of leadership in my family. It's a joint leadership model with me and my wife and how we raise our children and. And so, um, you know, if, if we don't have that understanding, um, as many men struggle with, about allowing their wife to influence them. And accept. and then and then the other thing is, you know, and I know I'm jumping a lot here, but I'm just sh- putting all this stuff out on the table, right? Um, we have uh, in many relationships where uh, many couples that come forward to seek help, um, they've done that after they've been down a long road. And oftentimes they go and they seek help when it's late in the game. And that's a problem in the Muslim community. And the reason why it's a problem is because when you seek help, it's never too late. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, but there's challenges with, with going in late. And one of the biggest challenges is that well, oftentimes the marital relationship has been uh, so stretched, uh, one person has emotionally distanced um, themselves from the relationship just to be able to survive and to live. And, and so now they rec- they've, they've recognized that, okay, we need help. And now the, and it's usually the man who's the one who hesitates, okay, now I'm ready because he sees his, his marital reality in shambles on many levels. And so now he steps forward and he's ready. But what's happened? There's all of the, there's this emotional injury, emotional pain, these grievances that are there on the other side with his wife. And he's saying, well, I look, I'm ready to work now. And now you're being resistant. Well, the reality is that there is so much pain that's there that really needs to be overcome in the process. So, you know, I mean, all of these uh, realities that really make um, uh, uh, that that we find in the community, um, and um, and I could go on and on, but I think I'll 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 stop here um, just for the purpose of um, being able to keep it concise. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh Suhail. I think that's a great segue um, into Brother Edmonds. Um, portion inshallah talking about how you were saying sometimes when people actually seek help it is too late and now brother Edmund will talk about how the, the necessity of talking about mental health care and, and really understanding when it is time for support from a younger age into marriage inshallah i'll pass it to you assalamu alaikum thank you for having me bismillahirrahmanirrahim alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam so um, Sheikh Suhail, mashallah, so refreshing. You speak my language, mashallah. Um, so much knowledge, and you could tell tons of experience in working with with married couples. Um, I wanted to like, we have to definitely talk more after this uh, Zoom, inshallah. So uh, talking about starting from young. So alhamdulillah, we have a lot of a lot of developing. Uh, material out there now when it comes to at least in public schools and so I think for the Islamic schools we really got to pull some of this in because uh, there's this recognition that um, along with what started off probably about 20 years ago in character education in schools they've now they realized that like okay some of some of the things that were taught through religious institutions growing up whether the church or even the mosques um, or the synagogues aren't isn't necessarily happening at home. So they were starting to teach those values in school, whether it's you know being good to your neighbor, you know sharing and these kind of things, serving your community. And so now what there what there's an emphasis on in public schools is social emotional learning. And so there's there are all kinds of books. It's a big industry right now. Um, and essentially, what the aim is, it's to equip young people with 
a, a large vocabulary of words that describe their emotions, you know, rather than just the simple ones like what the, that movie. I don't remember what it was. It was like a Disney movie. It was like sad, happy, mad. There was like five words that describe yeah, uh, emotions. And so um, and so now there um, there's this thing called a mood meter that came out of Yale. And it there's there I, I can't remember how many words, but it's probably at least like 50 words that can describe your mood or your emotions. And so for, for they're starting to use this in grade schools and trying to help kids understand, okay, what color are you in right now? And really what it's doing is it's creating a, a self-awareness. And, and this is huge when it comes to us as Muslims. You know, I always like to mention that, you know, that the word, the phrase in Arabic, kif halik, right? Like, or kif had, right? Like really literally translates so like, how is your state or what's your state? Right. And so this idea of being conscious of your state is not new to us as Muslims. And if we just actually paid attention before we answer that question, like, how how am I right now? And so that's what's happening. This self-awareness in public schools in America is like trying to help kids become more aware of what's the state I'm in? What can I do about it? Um, you know, can I shift into another state? Can I make other people aware of the fact that I'm in this state and I need a break or whatever it is? And so we do that all the way into high school now for a lot of a lot of high schools. And um, and and that's just one of those efforts out there to try to address mental health from an early age. The other thing that's that's going on when it comes to social emotional learning is bringing more awareness around mental illness. And you know, the stat that you had in the beginning of the slideshow was one in 10 men, I think you said, suffer from depression or anxiety. And I, I think it's much higher than that, actually. Um, maybe that's a clinical diagnosis. Um, but one of the things I like to tell people, especially young people, is that it's not whether it's not what it's not whether or not or you're going to be you're going to struggle with depression or anxiety. It's when you're going to struggle with depression, or anxiety at some point in your life, at some point in your life, you will be depressed period, right? But what are you going to do about it? So whether it's because your mother passes away or your dog passes away or whatever, or you don't get into medical school, whatever it is. And sometimes those depressions last for three days and sometimes it lasts for a long time. But then that's where that education comes in. At what point do you need to seek help? You know, is it just a conversation with your mom or your brother about it? And that might be enough. Or at what point is it more of a clinical issue where you're stuck and you need some professional assistance to help get you out of that state? Because we all have the potential to get in that state. One example I'll give people sometimes is, you know, I do a lot of public speaking and, um, and I love it. And, and I, especially when it's a topic like this that I love talking about and educating people on. And one time I was at the high school that I work at and I was giving, I had to get on the intercom and give an announcement. And in the middle of the announcement, my voice started to shake and I started to like lose my, get, get disoriented. I'm like, okay, wait, what was I going to say? And I was like, what is, what's going on with me? And when I evaluated that afterwards, I had to realize that I went into that speech at a high level of stress already. So whenever you public speak or do anything publicly, there's it, there's a little increase in anxiety. That's life. That's how it works. But you know what I realized is that I had a lot going on at that time in my life, and so my level of stress was really high. So when it came to adding just that little bit of extra, it it was a tipping point where it's it was affecting me physiologically, right? And that's another thing for us to consider is it, when it comes to seeking help, and we'll talk about that later, but. You know, there's one a lot of ways we evaluate that as social workers or as therapists. And one of them is, you know, is it affecting your health in any way? Is it affecting your family, your relationship? Is it affecting your job? And for young people, that's school. So um, when I do premarital counseling, one of the things I talk about with young, with people that are about to get married, I said, I would say the purpose of this is not for you to decide whether the person is good for you or not. I'm hoping that that's been decided already. And you're just here to kind of maximize the happiness and the, 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 you know, the calmness and peace in your marriage. And, and I say, premarital counseling is kind of like watching the news in the morning before you go to work. It helps you kind of figure out what the weather is going to be like or before that picnic or whatever it is. 
what the weather's going to be like and what the traffic's going to be like. Neither of you of them you have power over. You can't change either. But at least when they come, when you hit that traffic jam or when the thunderstorm comes, you're like, oh, here it is. And you're prepared for it. And you have less of an emotional reaction to it. So when you hit that roadblock with your spouse in marriage, it's like, oh, okay, here it is. Edmund talked about this in premarital counseling, and I guess a lot of couples struggle with this. So now it keeps me from saying, my wife is such a bad person, or my husband is such a whatever, because we're hitting this roadblock. So really, that's the way we got to think about teaching young people um, and getting them talking about mental health and having these conversations from a, from a young age. It could start when they're five. My son, it started for me with my son when he was, when I'd read him a bedtime story and we'd say our surahs, we always say the cools, right? Like, you know, that's say your cools, right? And and so we we, we say the surahs. And then um, when he's laying in bed, I would say, okay, now take a really deep breath. And up until this age, he's 17 now, mashallah. If I walk by his room at night, I notice he's still up and it's late and he's laying in his bed. I'll say, take a deep breath as I'm walking by and I just walk into my room. And it's just a reminder that we can control our body through other things, taking deep breaths. And we'll talk more about that. But, you know, as adults and going in later into life, you know, one of the things I was thinking about um, that Sheikh Hussein, Hussein, Sheikh uh, Hussein, yeah, yeah, Suhail, Sheikh Suhail was saying, is that, you know, like when, um, when it comes to going to a therapist, he talked about backsplaining. I love that term. Um, and that's all, one of the things that the black community in America has realized is that it really benefits from that, benefits them if they go to a black therapist because they don't have to do that backsplaining. And they've realized that recently because, especially recently, because, you know, in kind of the, 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 the paradigm that we have right now, no thanks to social media, is this idea that if somebody is making you upset, eliminate them, eliminate them out of your life. You know, um, they're toxic and there's all these names for them. And it's a reason just get them out of your life. And, and in mainstream America, a lot of therapists have no problem saying, don't talk to your parents anymore. They're bad for you. They're toxic. They do this. They make your body react this way. And there's a place for that in very few cases. But I talk a lot of my therapy, my, my clients about, okay, you can create space without eliminating people out of your life. And so when you, you tell a black person that, you tell, tell a Muslim, okay, eliminate your parents out of your life when they have such a strong connection to responsibility to their mom or their dad, especially their mom in the Muslim community and in the black community and in the Latino community, a lot of immigrant communities, it's, it creates a huge dissonance within themselves. And, and a lot of shame that creates other problems in their lives. And so, you know, going to somebody that understands your cultural background, I've had people come to me, Muslims come to me after seeing a therapist for years. And, and I'll ask them, the most famous one was a, a gentleman came to my office and he was standing in the middle of my office with gloves on. And he moved from out of state. And I said, I thought you were seeing a therapist for a long time. He said, yeah, for two years. And I said, okay well, what did you guys do? And he said, uh, well, um, I don't know, but he was awesome. And I was like, why was he so awesome? And he's like, he was an expert, an expert in fiqh by the time we got to finish working together. And I'm like, so he basically just used you to educate him on this concept of fiqh in Islam that was so foreign and blowing his mind. He's like, whoa, there are that many rules that he was feeding your anxiety. Right. And so, so, so I, you know, we really need to think about that. Either somebody either has to have been raised around Muslims and connect, very connected to the Muslim community, meaning knowing them. I could tell you so many stories like that. Um, and or, you know, um, a Muslim themselves and, and have a great understanding. Don't, they don't even have to be a scholar or anything like that. But just to understand that experience, the cultures that fall within our faith and in this country, but then also the religion and how that, you know, um, dictates our whole paradigm and worldview and everything else. Um, Let's see here. I wanted to say one more thing before my time is up. Uh, yeah. So, oh, so the other thing I want to talk about really quickly when it comes to men is it, one of the things experiences I'm seeing now, and I don't know if it, how it is in other cities, but um, so in Chicago, and, and you, you, I think you see it on social media too, is that 
for men, for for a big part, when it comes to teenage years, we all know everybody talks about teenagers and the hormonal changes that happen with teenagers. And for then then men have this big break in their life where they don't have to really deal with fluctuations of hormones until their late 30s and early 40s. And all of a sudden you start seeing a drop off testosterone. And a lot of men really struggle with that because it can make them feel a little bit less energetic, affects them with intimacy and all these other things. And then, and sometimes they feel mood swings, sadness, like out of the blue where they've never felt that before. And so the answer to that in America, because commercialized is billboards that say, are you struggling with low T? Let's basically give you test, uh, steroids. And then you have these men who go on steroids who are 45, 50 years old, and they start getting all huge and jacked, and they start having problems in their marriage. Because guess what? They also have like roid rage, and they become temperamental, and then their wife's like, what's wrong with you? And then they're not, they're not now on the same page in life with their wife going through life's changes, because they've now intervened medically in a way that's potentially harmful to couples and definitely the individual, because then they become dependent on it. What do you do then when you're taking roids for a long time? And all of a sudden, if you stop taking them, then what? Guess what? You have to go back to change, getting old again. <laughs> so I'll stop there and inshallah we'll move on to the next questions. Thank you. Jazakallah khair, Brother Edmund. It's like you guys planned this before you got here. That's a, a great segue um, into Sheikh Suhail's next part, inshallah, about prophetic examples of trial and how to, to how did how what are the prophetic examples of coping and how can we have healthy coping styles? And then inshallah, we'll move into more of a similar topic with Brother Edwin as well after, inshallah. I'll pass it to you, Sheikh Suhail. Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, my brother Edmund, um, I don't know how we haven't crossed paths, man, uh, yet, but um, we have, inshallah. Um, we have definitely some some notes to to to, to share and and such. Uh, love hearing you talk and and um, and hearing about your experiences in the in the community, which are so which seem to be so deep, mashallah. So um, you know, one of the things I think that's such an important. Um, uh, starting point for this discussion about prophetic resiliency, coping, dealing with life's trials, and so on and so forth, is understanding who the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in in terms of how he understood himself to be a man as it relates to how he carried himself uh, emotionally. And one, there's a beautiful example that speaks volumes to me um, about our Prophet Sallallahu that I think is so important for us to, to um, understand. There was an incident one time when the Prophet Sallallahu in one narration it said that he's bearing his son, in another it said that he's bearing his grandson. And, um, and as... He is at the gravesite, and of course, the community is there with him. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ is crying, and when there are tears coming down his face, one of the Sahaba, Saad, radiallahu anhu, he says to the, he says, "Ya Rasul," he says, "Wa anta ya Rasulullah," and he says, "And you, O Messenger of Allah." In other words, as if he's saying. And you, O Messenger of Allah, if anyone knows that death is coming and death will come when it's due to come, it's you. If anyone knows that life is full of trials and tribulations, it's you. If anyone understands that we have to accept what Allah has given us, no matter how difficult it is, it's you. So, anta ya Rasul, and even you, O Messenger of Allah, like you're crying. Look at what the Prophet ﷺ says. He says, "Inna al-ayna la tadma, wa inna al-qalb la yahzan." He says that the eyes they shed tears, and the heart it feels sadness, as if the Prophet is telling Saad, he's saying, "Don't try to regulate my emotions." Don't try to stop me from expressing what I need to express. 
This is a feeling, this is a human emotion that Allah has placed inside of me. And I am a man and I cry and I display sadness and I display happiness and I display anger and I display frustration and I and I have a whole myriad of feelings just like others do. Yes, how we navigate those emotions and how we display them in a way that is um, uh, befitting to how a Muslim should carry themselves is important, but the you know to put a to put a plug or to put a cap, uh, you know a lid on my emotions. Who? Why? Who? Who said that? Who said that? And you know, like it. A lot of times, um, in for example, in marriage, um, or or, or in in general in life, you know, uh, when when kids are kids, they're told don't cry. Don't be sad. Don't be mad. Don't be this. Don't be that. We don't learn how to um, to have emotion, and then for it to be carried out in in a in. And oftentimes we tell people these things. Why? Because we're uncomfortable as the receiver on the receiving end. It's uncomfortable to me to hear or to to see you display these negative emotions sadness anger um anxiety so i just tell you stop right and it's it, it's it's such a problematic um perspective from uh, uh you know how uh, the one who's uh you know there listening to this other person it's such a problematic way in which to engage people rather the prophet says him, he's teaching us like uh, like be who you are express yourself the way you need to express yourself and at the and in the next line the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says wala illa ma yurdi rabbana ta'ala but we don't say anything that's displeasing to allah i'm going to show emotion but i'm not going to say why ya allah this is horrible my life is miserable i can't believe that you put me in this pain and this difficulty that's no that that we don't that we don't go we accept what Allah has given us but to display the emotion I need to have that emotion to be balanced otherwise what I'm I'm going to put a lid on this and what like how am I even you know uh, that that emotion that needs to come out is going to come out in other ways that are unhealthy that are dysfunctional that are um, poor coping. Um, methodologies or mechanisms. So I think that's a really important, you know, sort of starting point when we talk about uh, prophetic coping, you know, just understanding emotions. Uh, and Brother Edmund made some reference to, to you know, how how we navigate emotions and, and the, 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 the proper way by which we do that too. And then if you look at, you know, some other aspects of the Prophet I mean, the Prophet Ali Salatu Salam was a beautiful example for us in every area of life. That um, our Prophet Sallallahu he uh, he understood what the purpose of marriage was. Marriage for him, for the Prophet was his internal support mechanism. Um, when when his wife Sayyidah Khadija, when she passed, it was extremely heavy on the Prophet. ﷺ. Why? Because if you look from day one, when the first revelation comes, the Prophet he comes to whom? He's he comes to his wife after he gets the revelation, he's extremely distraught. And he says, Laqad khashitu ala nafsi. Like I'm afraid for myself. I don't know what's going on with me. And what does his wife do? She consoles him in the most be- beautiful way. Allahu abada. That Allah will never forsake you. You help people, you support the poor, you carry the burdens of the weak, etc. And she validates him. So the Prophet um, um, he navigates or he leans on, he leverages his wife in a way that's very healthy. And in all of his marriages. You see the prophet, um, you know, he's incredibly open in his relationships and, and what an important support mechanism that is uh, that we have. Um, he's open to the advice of Um Salama 
you know, when they uh, when they go to Hudaybiyah and they're, they're, sorry, when they go to Umrah and they're prevented from making Umrah and, you know, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he says, we're done with our Umrah. And the Sahaba are like, what are you talking about? And they don't listen to him. The Prophet tells them to take off their ihram and to shave their heads and they don't listen. Who does he go to? He goes to his tent and his wife, Um Salama, tells him, tells the Prophet, says, just go out and do what you, do the action yourself and they'll follow. He takes the advice of her. And there's numerous examples of that. Um, how the Prophet ﷺ has this, you know, beautiful, su supportive relationship with his wives. And he takes from them. And of course, they take from him. The Prophet ﷺ, he has very healthy social connections. He's the prophet of God. Um, but that doesn't mean that he's free of social needs. That doesn't mean that he doesn't need companionship. Uh, Abu Bakr is his best friend and his comp closest companion. He has an intimate relationship with Umar. Um, and, and, you know, so he has these relationships that are so meaningful to him in his life. And that's an important thing for us, that we have meaningful social relationships. We have intimate friendships um, within our home and outside of our home. One thing that's lost in the social media world is is oftentimes, you know, deep relationships. People know a thousand people, but they don't really know one person um, on any level of any depth, right? So having deep social relationships is, is so important. Um, and then the Prophet ﷺ has a very intimate relationship with his creator, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So he, 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 has, he has this full life engagement on all of these different, planes of existence, outside of his home, inside of his home, in his own private, in his deepest private uh, personal relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has complete trust of Allah, he's patient uh, upon life's trials when they come to him. Um, and he has this, you know, he expresses it once so beautifully, right? When the Prophet goes through one of his most difficult experiences being run out of Ta'if um, when they chased him out of the city and and they uh, they threw stones at him and, and his blessed feet are bleeding. And he goes and later he makes dua, right? This famous dua that he makes. Um, a lot of events happen, but this, this one dua that he makes and one this one line in the dua that he makes, he says, he says, وَإِن لَمْ يَكُنْ غَضَبُكَ عَلَيَّ فَلَا أُبَالِي yeah, if, yeah, Allah, if you're not upset with me, as long as you're not upset with me and I'm doing what I need to do and I'm living, I don't care. Everything else, I can deal with life. I can deal with the difficulties. And so I'm not saying that it's always that easy, right? Like, yeah, we just, well, just, hey, look, man, just man up and deal with, deal with your stuff. I'm not trying to say that, right? Like, it's that simple. But I'm just I'm I'm just showing an example of how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had these extremely important relationships and these different aspects of his life that carried him. And so we take a great example from him uh, in that regard. So much more to say, I mean, about about this subject, right? So much more to learn, particulars to pull from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's life, but we'll suffice with that, inshallah. Shaykh. Sheikh Suhail, um, that was amazing. And those examples are so, so relevant to what we're talking about today. Inshallah, we'll press it to Brother Edmund to, to talk to us about tangible ways that we're able to seek support, uh, mechanisms that we're able to use to support us in our, in our journeys and accessing mental health um, and coping with any sort of trial, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Hold on one second, I'm just getting ready. There we go. Okay. So um I love that story from Ta'if because um that story always reminds me that you know that our prophet peace be upon him also had low points, you know, had you know attempted something to do good and was and was punished for it in this world, so it's felt to him. Um, he suffered for, I guess should be the, the phrase I should use. Um, and so 
that re- it's a reminder to me that sometimes in life you could have the best of intentions to do something and it could you, it could go fall really flat and and maybe also cause a lot of um discomfort and pain to you so um so one of the things that you know I want us to think about when it comes to seeking help and I think I'd first like to start off with um the prevention part of it and and as as adults and that is that you know there's some research coming out now talking about the child-centered marriage and how people of my generation um who are in their uh maybe 40s and 50s now um they we were too child-centered in how we raised our kids to the point that we were so consumed by putting our kids in 20 different activities and all weekend was wrapped up in running to this that event and that event and this event that we weren't focusing on our own emotional, physical health, the health of our marriage, our relationships, and or our friendships, which which Sheikh Hussel Suhail keep talked about. So like we what this is something that I always felt strongly about. And I ask my clients, the one of the things I'll say is that you need to look at it as if you know, we've all heard of this term, like, you know, how full is your bucket, that kind of concept. But you got a picture like a bucket in your life. And most Muslims know what a pressure cooker is. (laughs) And thanks to the Instapot, most America does too now. (laughs) But, you know, we we had to picture both of those things in our life. We have to have things for our bucket that make us feel alive, that bring us joy, a sense of adventure, whether that's travel, trying new food, going fishing, taking a hike, whatever those things are that that make you feel alive, laughing with friends. I like to tell a story to a lot of my young couples how uh, I have four brothers, three brothers, sorry, and a sister. And I went to my family's house early in my marriage. And we, you know, when you grow up with brothers, you all tease each other. And so we were like teasing each other. We were laughing so hard and we were leaving. My wife was really quiet. And I said, and, and she's, I said, well, you know, what's the matter? And like most wives, she said nothing. And then I said, no, honestly, what's going on? You're quiet. And then she said, well, you never laugh with me like that. And I just sat there for a second. And I said, you know what? I don't. And that's okay. I don't think I expect that from you. I don't know if I'm ever going to laugh that hard to the point of tears Maybe for maybe inshallah for married for 20 years plus, but I have 25 years with my brothers of inside jokes and teasing and a rhythm that we're only six months into. And so what we got to understand, the message behind that is that your spouse can't be everything to you in this world in, when it comes to relationships. And a lot of Muslim couples make that mistake. They get married and they disappear. Maybe they see church families, but then they don't even... They don't necessarily see friends or or anything else. And so um, we can't put that pressure on our spouse to be everything to you because they'll fail. And so understanding that we need those different relationships in our life to make us feel alive, sitting, you know, you could have a certain level of comfort with different relationships in your life. And then the pressure cooker is more about what calms you, what releases tension that could be running or some kind of exercise. It could be Salah, whatever it is. And times we know, you know, there's expansion and contraction when it comes to spirituality. And so sometimes you're praying and it feels really good. And then sometimes you're praying and then you finish and you're like, I don't remember if I did all four or Rakat or whatever. And so it just, you weren't really into it and that's life. And so understanding that we need, I actually had a coworker recently said to me, you know, she said something about doing yoga and she goes, you know, you have like that prayer thing you do. She's like, well, I don't have anything like that. So like when I go to yoga, I don't even see it exercise. I just want to like clear my mind, you know, and that's why you're seeing yoga centers everywhere in America now and in uh, mindfulness centers, these kind of things, uh, meditation centers, because people are craving for what we already have. If we just understand that these things all have a place in our life and it's important to maintain them. So when it comes to seeking help, um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, it's important that we, when it comes to ourselves or somebody that we live with, with our family members, it's important that we understand that um, if it's interfering, first of all, one of the things I like to say is if it's lasting longer than a month, your sadness or your anxiety, and you're noticing that, that you probably should get some help for it. 
And what people need to understand is that going to see a therapist doesn't mean you're committing to seeing them once a week for the next year. Sometimes it might help if you just have three sessions. And like I was saying earlier with the premarital counseling, sometimes just hearing that some things are normal. Oh, yeah, that's a normal reaction. I had a, a woman who came in and she had a, 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 her son had passed away about six months before. And she came in. She goes, I don't know if I'm going crazy, but I just don't want to go back to work yet. And she's like, and people are telling me I should be over it by now. And I said, and how many of those people lost a son? Zero. Right. So sometimes just hearing that your experience of this life event, whatever it is, is a very normal reaction to somebody who loses their son unexpectedly. It's devastating. And most people aren't going to understand you. And so just to go to see a professional who's probably dealt with this before and can normalize some of that for you. And sometimes just three or four sessions can be really helpful. And then maybe you see them once every couple months for the next year just to kind of see how things are going. And then you obviously have situations where it's really significant mental illness, the chemical imbalances like bipolar or schizophrenia, which again, you know, you see times where it hits in life like in 17, 18. And then there's another time that that kind of hormonal change I was talking about, late 30s, where it hits people as well. And um, again, the earlier you can intervene for those, you're much better off because otherwise it's hard to get people on medication for those if you wait too long. Most communities in America now, alhamdulillah, have um, a local co uh, you know, like county health department. So, um, and I'm not from California, but I know that you, you have the 988, 988 hotline now, you, you know, instead of calling 911, 988 is just a hotline for mental health. They just present to somebody the challenges that you're having and they can refer to you to uh, a resource in the community. If somebody's reached out in the past year, they probably have been very frustrated because in the past year it was very difficult to find any openings with any experienced therapist in the community. But I could tell you that within the past, maybe like three months, it's opening up again. Um, so you're having a lot more openings for experienced mental health professionals. Um, and then also there are text options out there. So a lot of, you just got to kind of, you know, we, we have Google available to everybody and you can just ask, you know, for crisis hotline and there are people that are, that are experienced dealing with crises and they can kind of give you some guidance on those things. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, seeking out somebody like anybody else, if you know a cousin or a family member that's been to a therapist, it, it helps if you have somebody that you trust that you know does good work, um, because that's important. Like I mentioned earlier, there are some, my dad actually, he used to work for a labor job for the phone company back when we all had landlines. And he used to tell me, he said, he used to say, you know, Edmund, there, there are bad you know, doctors, there are bad therapists and there are bad phone men. He's like, you just got to find the good ones. Um, and, and it's true because he'll tell you stories of doctors he went to. He's like, can you believe what this guy told me to do? So, you know, it's important that you find somebody that's reputable and, and that, that somebody else has experienced and, and worked with. Um, the other thing I want to say is that, you know, when it comes to like, my example of the book, and I'm just going to wrap it up, wrap it up with this, but um, we got to, you know, seeking knowledge for some people is an adventure. And it's something that can make people feel alive. And that's why people are like, I'm going to go back and get this degree, or I'm going to go study. Um, and, and it's, it's a bit of an adventure. There's something exciting about it. There's an element of accomplishment with it, but we got to see mental health as seeking knowledge of the self. That that's it's not about fixing a mental problem, but about just gain, gaining an understanding of why do I do the things I do, and what and then how can I maximize my happiness, my calm, my peace, whatever it is you're looking for in life. Um, how do I fix some of this dysfunction that's happening in my life? If you know you've been trying to you know be calmer with your children or calmer with your spouse and you can't do it, okay. Let me try to gain some of that. And ultimately, that's what Hassan is like, this concept of, you know, acting and gaining knowledge in a way that would, as if Allah is watching you to perfect yourself, to work on yourself. And that's really what it is. Um, just like all these people, all these videos out there, people exercising now, here's the best way to do curls, and here's the best way to do this. And 
work on your legs, whatever. I mean, we need to focus on our, our mental health because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how fit you are. If your mental health is in shambles, you're going to be extremely unhappy. So um, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Brother Edmund. And Jazakallah khair. So with that, we're going to move into our question and answer session, inshallah. Um, for folks listening, please go ahead and send any questions or comments you may have. There should be a box at the bottom of the screen which allows you to submit. I do have one question that was sent to me, um, which is, give me one second. The question is, is saying that we've been talking about um, you know, mechanisms and tools as to ways that we're able to, you know, self-regulate and, and um, like coping mechanisms for ourselves and ways that we're able to seek support. But um, how are we as community members, as family members, um, as partners able to support whoever it is in our life that is struggling through um, any sort of mental health problems or any sort of depression um, to that extent? Well, I'll start. Um, so uh, it, it is hard with family members sometimes because it, it is hard for anybody when you want to tell them, like, I think you should get help for something. Um, as long as we always start with a message of care and love and concern, and that as a uh, is where you're um, from a perspective of we're trying to fix something about them, um, sharing that you're invested in their happiness as a person and their their calm and their peacefulness, their peace in their life. Um, or the relationships. Uh, and a big thing, you know, for when it comes to how you can support somebody in your life um, outside of getting them help is really just listening, listening and affirming. It's kind of like uh, Sheikh Husayl, Suhail, I keep saying that, sorry, I apologize for Sheikh Suhail said earlier, um, you know, when it comes to validating people's feelings, a lot of times we tell people, you know, the example that we'll give sometimes is if a kid falls in the playground, you know, the mis two mistakes that parents make. The first one is like, you're fine. It's, it's okay. It doesn't hurt. Get up. It's okay. You know, and then that's denying their pain. And the second one is like, oh, my God, come here. Let me see. I can't believe this playground is so dangerous. And you take them from the playground. The first one tells them their pain isn't real and their experience isn't real. And the second one says, oh, this playground's big and bad. Stay away from it. Life is dangerous. Stay away from it. And the third one, the third and more appropriate approach is like, wow, that must really hurt. Let me see it. Oof. Yeah, it hurts when you get scrapes like that. It probably stings, right? Affirming their tears and their pain. And then let's bandage it up and then we'll rinse it off some water. It's going to sting a little bit, but then you'll be ready to get back in there and play. And you you let them know that it's going to be fine. Yeah, life life is tough, but we can get through it. And I'm going to help you with that. And then you're going to move on and you're going to be fine. So um, a big part of it is affirming what people are going through, listening and not not trying to, um, you know, there's actually some, Brene Brown has some videos out there about the difference between sympathy and empathy. And they're pretty good. They're cartoons. And it just talks about like the things that you could say um, to try to help them through that. Thank you. Anything to add on to that, Sheikh Suhail? Sure. Um, uh, the only thing I would just say, I would uh, echo everything that Brother Edmund said, and and he talked about listening. And, you know, so for some people, listening comes naturally. And for others, they need to learn how to listen. Um, and so just learning a bit of active listening skills, which are very basic and, and very um you know, a, a little bit of a, a skill set that needs to be, uh, if you have someone in your family that is struggling with their mental health, that perhaps even has a mental health disorder, um, then it would behoove you if you have a very good relationship with them, but you don't feel like you know how to listen to them, or you feel like you're always compelled to give advice to them and to fix them or whatever it is. Just learn these active listening skills, which, as Brother Edmund said, is, you know, basically learning how to validate their feelings, um, how to uh, let them know uh, that you hear them. And then there is a time and a place uh, when you ask them, um, is there anything 
you want from me? Is there anything I can help from, from you? Do you want me to listen? Or are you looking for some actual guidance in this particular matter? If, if there is a parental authority sort of relationship there, or even a peer relationship, um, and you ask them, you know, you're, you're sharing this information with me, and it sounds like you're going through a very difficult time, and I'm, I'm, so, happy, I'm so happy that you trust me, and I'm, I'm, I'm more than willing to listen to you. And, um, but are you also, do you want something more from me? And, you know, with our kids, for example, um, uh, a lot of fathers, I had a father one time, um, one of the, you know, one of the marriage retreats we did, and he says, well, isn't my job as the dad to just give advice? Like to tell everybody in my family what to do, my wife, my daughters. And I was really shocked by his sort of take on, you know, on life that, you know, like this is his charge in life. I'm just supposed to be this rock and just dishing out, here you go, here's advice. This is how you need to fix this problem. This is how you need to fix this problem. No, man, your daughters need you to listen to them. They need you to just be there. Your wife just needs you to validate uh, her when she's had a, t a rough day and not tell her, well, you know, if you had done this, well, that wouldn't have happened. So, so you know, just that fine tuning, that, that listening uh, skill set is really important, especially if you don't have it naturally. Thank you. So for our next question, um, it says you've, uh, we've addressed struggling with awkwardness and embarrassment, um, but and all of these are important issues, but kind of uh, shifting to, to the area of stigma. How would we relate stories in Hadith or of Sahaba of people who are very ashamed or in extremely shameful circumstances are able to slow down, digest mentally their emotional turmoil, and how the Prophet them validated their stress or walked them through it, that prophetic example of dealing with stigmas or shame? So I'll I'll take this um, if I if I, I if I understand the question correctly, um, how did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in essence, uh, provide an open environment, a safe environment where people could come to him? If we're talking about him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, to freely share and and you know and open up and. And such, and and how do we replicate that in our lives? I, I think that's what's being asked in essence, right? Um, the prophet was such a beautiful example of that, you know. And there's so many, there's so many um, uh, scenarios where we see that. So there's, for example, the young man who comes to the prophet sallam, and he says, "Ithni ya Rasulullah bizina." He says, "Yeah, yeah, O, o Messenger of God." Um, give me permission to commit zina, to fornicate, to engage in some sexually inappropriate act. And all of the other companions, they're, they, they're saying, uh, they're saying, ma, ma, like, be quiet. What are you saying? How dare you? And the Prophet ﷺ just very, you know, gently says, bring him close. He didn't make him feel shame for asking the question. He didn't shut him down. In fact, he pulled him towards him himself. Uh, and he allowed himself to express himself. Uh, he allowed him to share about what's going on with him, even though the young man knows that what he's proposing is not good, but that's but he's but he's going to a source to get help. And so I think that's the exact point, right? That um, this young man, he knew what he was asking is not right, but he felt comfortable enough to bring this to the Prophet Sallallahu and, and so he didn't do anything yet. And he's trying to navigate, well, I have these feelings, I have these urges, I have these desires. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do, right? That's in essence what he's saying. And, and so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi says, and he, he doesn't shame him and doesn't even quote Quran on him. He doesn't, you know, uh, this the word spiritual bypass. I think it's careful how we, you know, how we um, kind of maybe just freely throw that word around sometimes. But but he didn't in this case spiritually bypass him and just start, um, you know, quoting Quran and quoting quoting things and saying, "Don't you know Allah says, Wala taqrabu zina.' You shouldn't go close to zina." He didn't take that approach with him because he knows the boy knows. 
but rather he used a different sort of reasoning tactic with him. Do you, do you wish that for your mother? Would you want that for your mother? Would you want that for your sister? And the, and the, the young man, he says, no way, Ya Rasulullah, right? So creating that open atmosphere, um, um, allowing people who, who, that we are close with to, uh, to feel safe with the conversations that they can have with us and for us not to instantly jump on and blame and, you know, put down. And, um, you know, this, there's another example of when um, uh, there is a man who was an alcoholic and he drank once and they were he was punished he drank again and he was and and one time uh you know the, the, he was he was being punished this was a sort of reformative punishment to help him refrain from his from his drinking and um while this man is taking this punishment one of the companions that's there that's there he says la'natullah alayk you know he says you know, may Allah curse you. And the Prophet ﷺ, he, he tells him, he, in essence, he tells this other man, how dare you say that? This man, he loves Allah and his messenger. He says, don't help shaitan against your, la tu'ina shaitana ala akhik. Don't help shaitan over your brother. Like, support him. He has admitted that he has done wrong. He admits that he's struggling. He's going through a rough time. Don't kick a man while he's down. Right, but rather be there to support him um, in that moment of struggle. So that I think that you know um, is re is really important. It's, again, especially for parents, um, not to just when your kids open up to you, that is such a a blessing. When your kids open up to you, so something wrong that they've done, it's such a blessing. A lot of times we blow it. And we start criticizing, didn't I tell you so? I told you never to go there. I told you never to, I told you not to deal with that person. They're coming to you because they feel bad. And they need you to say that, no, uh, 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 I'm sorry that you went through that. And I'm sorry that, you know, um, you had to experience that. And I, I pre and I'm, I'm glad you came to me, right? And rather than, because if you shut them down, they're not going to come to you again. So keeping that openness and that, you know, that sort of safe space is so important. For the sake of time, we will move on to the next question, inshallah. Um, I'm going to combine two of them. Um, I hope it doesn't reduce one or the other. But uh, one of the questions is about somebody's father, who, or elderly father recently moving here after war has broken out in their country. He's facing stress and depression. Um, and has critical medication that he has to take, but due to the stress and depression, he no longer wants to take the medication and seeing a therapist is out of the question for him. So the question is, um, you know, what are ways to either support him through this, support him and try, should they be supporting him and trying to take his medication um, and how to move forward that if there is any advice on this question, inshallah. Yeah, I can start on this one. Um, one of the beautiful things about our community is um, kind of the village perspective on how we support each other. And one of the things I learned, you know, I'm a convert, alhamdulillah, to Islam. And so coming into the Muslim community, I, and then being a therapist in this community, I, I've seen how um, it could create challenges with the mesh families, kind of like stepping on each other's toes a lot. But then also in events of crisis like this, um, where the family can become really supportive. And so one of the things that um, you can consider doing in this scenario is one of two things. Does he have an older brother or sister that's alive that can possibly influence him? Um, and or uh, just a group of, of peers, meaning in the family, his siblings, um, that can get together and express concern. And or does he have respect for the local imam of the masjid? that maybe you can set up a meeting with them to at least start there um, so that you don't have to feel alone through this. And then the last um, effort would be his kids, all of his kids getting together and saying, not to say that they have to get, that he has to get mental health treatment if he's going to, that's going to ca cause a fight, 
but at least talk about the medication and your take the loving approach that we're Baba, we're concerned about you. Abba, we're concerned about you. We want you to be here for many years for our, for your grandchildren. You know, can you consider taking this medication? This is what doctors are saying. And then, and then this is where we also, um, mashallah, I'm having this experience with my mother-in-law. It, it it comes back to us having to actually give them the medicine every day. Um, not not necessarily because of refusal. Sometimes they just forget. And so, just like you would, and this is what's so beautiful about Islam is the responsibility towards your parents. This is why it's so emphasized because the fact that, you know, this is, it's, it's all the full circle because it's like having my five-year-old, six-year-old back in the house again. I have to remind them, go brush your teeth. You forgot to brush your teeth. And that's not what I have to remind her, but it's other things. Right. And so, um, so part of it is, is taking advantage of, the cultural models that we have, we want to sometimes throw those out the window sometimes because they can be frustrating, but there are very strong benefits to it. And I found the 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 one, and especially in the Desi community, in the Indo-Pak community, you know, with uh, the older brother can really be a powerful one um, or older sibling that can influence the younger sibling because the um, reverence is so strong. So I don't know that, that person's scenario, but um, I think uh, I think you said the war torn area, so it probably wasn't the Desi community. But Either way, trying to find um, a sibling that can have influence and or other family members. Jazakal khair for that um, response. I do have a couple of more questions and inshallah we can get through all of them. I think this one is quite timely considering next week is Eid inshallah. Um, so the, the question is, it starts with a statement saying that um, this person always goes into severe depression during like around the time of Eid. My family doesn't, their family doesn't do anything. Um, they've tried every. they feel as if they've tried everything they could, but going to read events alone, not knowing anyone is a struggle. Um, so if there's any advice around this. I'll share one piece of advice and, uh, and I imagine uh, brother Edmund would have um, something to add. And I think, in, uh, so one thing that uh, comes to mind is, you know, it can be very, it can be very lonely um, coming into a Muslim community and not knowing anyone. Maybe as a convert, maybe as somebody, re, you know, with a renewed commitment to Islam. Maybe you had a Muslim family, but they never practiced. Whatever it was, um, and it can be very difficult navigating these happy times, um, Eid uh, in particular. And Christians have the same challenge during Christmas, you know, and and if they're uh, if they don't have family and such. But for us as Muslims, one thing I think that one a person should consider doing is is becoming their own advocate and taking um, some forward steps of their own. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, Eid is one point in time. But your life in the community uh, is is you know is there year round, and so if you develop strong ties in the community, if you become an active participant in the community, um, you're connected to whatever committee or group or you know function of the local masjid or the local Muslim community, and you involve yourself, you go and you volunteer, you'll make friends, you'll be connected. Um, and it's not easy, it's not difficult to get connected to the Muslim community. There's so many opportunities. If you're a good cook, cook some good food and people, and you're in. If you're a good something, you know, you have a good skill set, go and contribute and you're in. It's it's not as difficult as sometimes we make it. And so that way, when Eid comes around, you're there, you're part of the community. And if you're not, and if you know, and, and you may even have to take one other step and, and tell one of your friends, say, look, you know, Eid comes around and, you know, you all have your family gatherings, you have your extended family, you get together and you do this stuff. And, but I don't have anybody. Can I come hang out with you guys on Eid? And it's, it's, and I'm, and I'm serious. It's just a simple ask. And if you're already connected, they just, a lot of people just don't realize, they don't know, right? They don't know that, they don't know that the person sitting next to them doesn't have the support system and the structure that I've taken for granted my whole life because I come from a Muslim family and we have our deep roots and whatever. Um, so, but, but it takes some work, right, on your end to be connected. And, that, and then if it needs that extra layer of asking straight up, no big deal. And, and Muslims will, once, you, once you're in and once you're, and then you're halas, you're in for life, right?
Anything to add to that, Brother Edmund, before we wrap up? I would just agree. Being a convert myself, I've had some of those experiences early on in my life, and I know what that feels like. It's one point where I had no idea how how packed the masjid got during Eid prayer, this one masjid I was going to go to. And so I didn't even make the Eid prayer because I, I caught like the last 10 seconds of it because I that got caught in traffic. And then I was praying and then people started leaving the masjid and I got trampled in the, during after the Eid prayer. So not hurt or anything, but people were kicking me and stuff while I was trying to finish my prayer. So, um, so yeah, so I understand that experience and that's exactly it. And actually, that's one of the things I did was I, I started volunteering in the community and made some friends. I would get invited to people's houses during Ramadan and that kind of thing. And I've also worked with clients who have gotten divorced and maybe they moved here to marry their spouse. And so now they don't have any family here. And then Ramadan comes, Eid comes, and they're just, they struggle. So that's one of the things that they do is they'll, they'll start volunteering in the masjid or just getting involved in the community in some way and just creating, a, creating finding their people, basically. So, yeah, I would agree. Thank you. So we are at about time. I do have one more question that I would like to just ask if that's okay, inshallah. Um, so somebody, I, I know earlier we were discussing about, or Brother Edmund, you were saying that now a lot of us talk about, you know, removing ourselves from situations where we're not comfortable, removing ourselves from the harm that is happening, um, things to that extent. So a question I have is that if somebody knows that um, their parent has abused sexually or otherwise someone in the past, um, they've gone through this experience, like what what is um like is there a right to cut them off or how do we engage that that situation particularly from the islamic perspective of cutting that person off or that parent off and maybe we can start with you sheikh suhail okay bismillah so um i have we deal with this a lot in the community and um islam said or allah says ihsana that i should show ihsan to my parents um well ihsan is needs to be contextualized based on what you as an individual are going through and so if i have a parent and i'm not speaking to this exact scenario but i'm giving you the the, the general principle um if i have a parent that um and we've you know we've faced many we've had many cases of this somebody who who has narcissistic personality disorder um not only is a narcissist but he's a true narcissist in the full sense of the word and then nothing i ever do is good enough it's always about him i'm hurt in every single inter interaction that i have with them etc cetera, etc cetera. well what do i do I, 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 and they're getting old and they have needs and what am i supposed to do how do i if um if by you engaging them, you are giving them space to hurt you, and in essence, they are uh, piling up their evil deeds, their sayyat, because you, you're you carrying on your relationship with them, and, the, and in turn, they're abusing you, they're doing things that are hurtful and so forth, then in essence, you're not doing ihsan. You... You follow what I'm saying? You are um, supposed to treat them well, and you're supposed to make sure that they also, that you are also a doorway for them to be in a good, in good standing with Allah. But if you're giving them space in your life by which to abuse you, then they're not doing right by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you're not doing ihsan with them. Um, and so, you know, you take that principle and you apply it to your situation if there is, uh, uh, and, and, and so, and I tell clients this all the time, um, or people at different stages of life, um, in Islam, we're not allowed to cut off relationships, relations. That's a red line that we're not allowed to do. So if you have, if you're the relationship between my, myself and my brother Edmund, for example, I should have my door wide open because I trust him, he's a beautiful brother, and I, I love him for the sake of Allah, and and we want to have, you know, we want to have a, a relationship where it's just open between the two of us. But when I have a relationship with someone who's put bringing harm at me, I need to close the door a little bit. It's still open, but I open it, uh, you know, it's still open, but they need to knock, right? 
to fully come in for me to open up the door. Um, it's not wide open for them to just come in and ram, ram, you know, down my, down, down my throat, things that are harmful to me. You know what I mean? Um, so, so, the, and then if you have somebody who's very hurtful and abusive towards you, the door is still open. It's just barely cracked. But it's, you didn't cut the, you, you don't, don't say that I will never talk to them again. Maybe you don't have to talk to them, but for once, one time a year, right? And so that's how you balance out that sort of, that directive, Islamic directive of not, of not cutting off family ties, but at the same time, applying ihsan in a way that is appropriate and not harmful or hurtful to yourself. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, when I mentioned that that earlier, um, I would agree 100% with Sheikh Suhail and what he said. I mean, the, the, the challenge, there's a difference between somebody who you argue with because you don't get along that well and somebody who actually has caused physical or sexual harm to you or somebody you know. And um, then that's just, that's just enabling them if you put them in that situation again. And so you don't want to be somebody that's, that's how I think what Sheikh Sohail was saying when you you know, you you almost allow them to do their sin then. So um, definitely in those cases, you first, you know, it's when it's in Islamic law, you know, first remove harm is one of the, the main maxims. Like if, if this person causes harm and establishes to cause harm to people, it's different if somebody's just a little selfish every now and then, and they don't, you know, aren't, aren't that friendly with you when you go to their house and that kind of thing. But when they've actually committed abuse to people, that's a different scenario. And we need to protect ourselves from them and, and our loved ones from them as well. And I didn't see the question, by the way, I just read read now the question. And um, and I apologize, I framed it in sort of general uh, general framework, but you're talking about actual sexual abuse um, do you, uh, you know, and, and, and so I would say the same thing that I said before, but that door is, is, you know, it's closed to the absolute maximum because you need to protect yourself. And that person needs absolute permission from you to be able to step into your world. Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and close it off there. Um, I'm going to ask Sheikh Suhail to close us off on a dua, inshallah. And then I am asking folks to stick around. We do have a feedback form, inshallah. We're always trying to improve these learning circles and healing circles so everyone can benefit to the maximum, inshallah. I want to thank again, Brother Edmund and Sheikh Suhail for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, it has been such an informative session. I myself have taken so much out of it. So Jazakallah khair. May Allah reward you for your efforts and your time spent with us today, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> اللهم اجعلنا من الذين يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسن. Ask Allah to make us from those who hear the words that were said today and to take what is best from it. And we ask Allah to bring healing to the hearts of those that are dealing with all sorts of life struggles. We ask Allah to give, uh, to bring happiness uh, to the sad hearts. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give stability to those hearts that are that are wavering and that are anxious and we ask Allah to um, mend the wounds that are there uh, between us uh, in our relationships and we ask Allah to strengthen the bonds of friendship and love and brotherhood and sisterhood between us and we ask Allah to um, bring our hearts together always for his love, always for his sake.